from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. We're going to go ahead and begin. Uh, my name is Mike Affeldorf. Uh, you are in Library of Congress 101 for Teachers. I would like to introduce our presenter, Cheryl Letterly. Cheryl Letterly has worked as an educational resources specialist at the Library of Congress since December of 2003. She has advanced the library's educational mission by providing professional development both in person and via webinar. She has also played a significant role in shaping the library's online repository of classroom materials and resources for teachers at loc.gov backslash teachers and continues to contribute to the development of those materials. She has 15 years of experience teaching English at both the high school and community college levels. We're very lucky to have her here. Cheryl, take it away. Thanks, Mike. It is my privilege and honor to be here with you tonight, giving you a tour of the Library of Congress for teachers. So this is me at an earlier conference. It's because you might like to know who you're talking with. Um, so my, some thoughts on what we'll do today. We're going to look at what the library has for teachers, and we're going to look at lesson plans, primary source sets, ebooks, webinars, and other professional development opportunities, social media channels, and more. And along the way, I would invite you to use that chat box to share your top tip, tips, favorite resources, and experiences so that we are learning together um, I always enjoy hearing from teachers and find it very rich and wonderful to know what what do you find useful, where do you get hung up, so that we know what we might focus on next. Um, this is not going to be a search webinar. Um, we're really going to look at what we've built for teachers in particular, but hold that thought. I have some scoop as of about 3.30 this afternoon, some scoop on a search webinar. So just hold that idea. What I'd like you to do first is take you briefly to Capitol Hill to visit the Library of Congress as we do. Oh, Emily, Taylor, and Haley, I hope you resolve your computer problems. Mike will interact with you about that. While I'm talking a little bit about where the library is and what it does, feel free to use the chat to let me know and let everybody else on here know where you are, what state you're in, what grade or grades you teach, and what subjects you teach. Um, so you'll see if you look at this to orient you a little bit. Near the top center of the screen is a tall white figure. That's the Washington Monument. The orangish circle that you see just about dead center is around the Capitol building. The big, big blue circle is around the library's Capitol Hill campus. We have three buildings. Um, and the small yellow circle is around the most famous of the three buildings, the Thomas Jefferson Building. Thank you to those of you who are chiming in. It looks like you come from many different geographic places and teach a wide variety of subjects, and I appreciate that. A little more about the library. This is a different angle with the Capitol front and center. Behind the Capitol and a little bit to the left, under the lowest box of text there, is the Supreme Court building. And Behind the Capitol and to the right is, again, the Thomas Jefferson Building. Um, and I've always enjoyed the juxtaposition of these three institutions so close together. So a little bit about the library. It holds more than 160 million items. And to uh, house all of those, we have, um, it's a changing number, but more than 830 miles of bookshelves. Just stop and think about that for a minute, 830 miles. From where I'm sitting in Washington, D.C., 830 miles is what? From here to Atlanta, maybe? Um, the library receives 15,000 items daily. Many of those are through copyright deposit. 
And of those, it adds about 12,000 items to the collection every business day. So it's a big and growing bigger institution. Here's a peek inside. And what I'd like you to do is take a good look at this picture right now. So if you're still typing, finish your typing or pause your typing for a minute. I'm going to pause for about 20 seconds and ask you to take in as many details about this picture on screen as you can. But don't start typing them yet. Now, take just a minute and jot down a few details that you remember. And feel free to read what other people noticed and build on their answers. So I'm going to pause my conversation for just about 10 seconds while you answer this. Thank you for kicking us off, Janelle, noticing the arches and columns. And Mary builds on that and notices very specifically three statues in each arch. Circular format, statues. Maria notes that she finds the light on the table make the room cozy. William says there are writing areas. William, I might push on that a little and say, what are the details that um, build up a writing area for you? Um, lots of details here, a small eagle at the very top of the arches. You guys are good observers. Take a minute and scan this list and see, did somebody notice something that you didn't? <coughs> so a little bit about this room. This is the main reading room of the Library of Congress, perhaps the most famous space within the Library of Congress. If, you, uh, if you're of a certain age, you might have seen this in the film All the President's Men. If you're um, a little younger, uh, you might have seen this in National Treasure 2 a little more recently. But this is an actual working reading room. If you come to the Library of Congress here in Washington, D.C., and you're above the age of 16, you can do your own work in this room. Um, so I just wanted to take you into the library for a minute, and I tied that to an activity that we like to use to get people involved in, in, in observing and comparing their observations, um, you've done a great job of writing down observations in about 20 seconds. <clears throat> so now on to the main part of the tour. We've visited the library briefly. Um, here's the library's home page. And I will point out, I didn't want to say this earlier because I didn't necessarily want you popping out, but all of these slides are hot linked to the page. So if you want to explore something now or through the recording later, um, go ahead, feel free to click on it. It will take you to a new browser window. And you just need to return to this window to resume the webinar. So loc.gov, the Library of Congress homepage, under collection highlights are ooh, tens of millions of items. I don't know an exact number. I'm fond of saying, what's the most exciting thing about searching the Library of Congress? About 30, 000, about 30 million items. What's the most frustrating thing of searching the Library of Congress online? About 30 million items. So we're going to zero in <clears throat> on the teachers page, loc.gov slash teachers. Again, this slide is hyperlinked. My colleagues and I spend our professional lives um, trying to make those millions of primary source items more accessible to you, to teachers. And one of the um, easiest access points is to subscribe to the Teaching with Li the Library of Congress blog right there in the center of the home page. Um, it's keyword searchable. I did a search on informational text because it seems like that's an important concept and phrase in a lot of classrooms. And this pulled up 22 results on a variety of kinds of approaches. And you can search it for 
other things as well. Whatever you're interested, I'd encourage you to try a few different approaches. Back to the teacher's home page. I'm going to anchor out of this page. Um, again, I would invite you in the chat. If you have experience with these materials, share them in the chat. If you have questions, share those in the chat. Mike will be harvesting them, and I'll return to them um, at the end of the session and answer as many as I possibly can. The first place I'd like to show you, I'm just going to work through the left nav of this page, is using primary sources. It's kind of a nuts and bolts of how to use primary sources, why to use primary sources, including engaging students, developing critical thinking skills, and constructing knowledge, citing primary sources. <coughs> it might be small on your screen, so I'm going to just point out to you that we have published format examples for Chicago and MLA, and we focused this um, on the most common kinds of primary source materials that uh, you would encounter on the library's website. We get a lot of questions about copyright in primary sources, and the library is the home of the US Copyright Answer so, uh, Office, so we try to answer at least some basic questions there. Of course, we get questions about where to find primary sources, and if you want to branch beyond the uh, teacher built things, here, here are some starting places. And then finally, and I'll return to this and talk to it a little bit more later, we have teacher's guides and an analysis tool for guiding analysis. And again, I'll return to that in more detail in a few minutes. Back to the anchor point, the teacher's home page. Um, I'd like to explore some of the classroom materials that we have. These are perhaps my favorite place. First, you should know that they're searchable by standards. All of these classroom materials, you can search by Common Core, or if you uh, want to use your own state content standards, that. Or we have um, aligned them to the standards of a select number of organizations um, if you're looking for something that way. The first place I'd like to pause and, and look at more closely are the primary source sets. Those are sets of primary sources around particular curricular themes. What I've pulled up is the Constitution, because last I checked, this was the most popular, at least measured by the number of clicks into it. And I'd like to point out that um, in the red circle, there are a couple of stopping places we're going to go in the next few slides. Each primary source set, in addition to the primary sources themselves, which you can see arrayed at the bottom of the page, has uh, there will be a teacher's guide. The analysis tool and guides are also linked here. And there's a student discovery set attached to this one. So first, the teacher's guide provides historical background and also some teaching ideas. Um, what we heard from teachers when we asked them about using the library's published lesson plans sounded very familiar to me. Um, what I heard was, what we heard, was that they tended to pick out the primary sources, pick out the ideas, and then reconfigure those ideas and primary sources into their own lessons. And so these primary source sets are just that. It's the primary sources and the ideas deconstructed, because what we heard was teachers don't need us to write their lesson plans. Here's a closer look at the Teacher's Guided Analysis Tool page. Up at the top, we have two versions of the analysis tool. There's a printable PDF version that, if you want to use paper, that is the route to go. And if you're wanting to use a digital tool, there is a link to the primary source analysis tool. They're parallel to the analyzing to the primary source teacher's guides. Um, a general one for analyzing primary sources of general sort, and then a number of format specific ones. And each teacher's guide has a question set 
um, aligned to that format to help you as a teacher know the kinds of things to ask your students to go deeper in. Here's an example, the Analyzing Primary Sources Teacher's Guide. Um, and I'm going to click back to the analysis tool. You notice it uses the same columns of observe, reflect, and question. And I've put red circles on a couple of places um, to note. One is that this online analysis tool has a drop down. If you'd like to customize it with questions by format, you can, you can do that using that drop down. And then what that gets you is the second slightly lower red circle is around a small um, um, Maria, it's it's on the website and it's hot linked from this page. So we'll we'll uh, several access points. Um, that question icon will give students a set of prompts that they can use to help them do a deeper analysis of the primary source. And again, the teacher's guide. One thing I'd like to point out that's on the teacher's guide, but not the primary source analysis tool, is at the very at the very bottom, there are some follow-up activity ideas, um, beginning, intermediate, and advanced. And I would say that those um, levels are more the complexity of implementing it than anything else. I often use the beginning ones in teacher workshops where I want to deepen the user experience without a huge heavy lift on my part. So I, I recommend looking at those as well. The last thing, and this was on back on the primary source set page, is 12 of the primary source sets have an additional component, and that is a student discovery set that's free on iBooks. Um, that's all of the um, primary sources from the set loaded in just for students with particular tool sets. What's up on screen right now is an annotation tool that allows students to draw on, to mark up um, the primary source in the on their in the ebook. This might look familiar if you look closely. This is a built-in primary source analysis tool with questions. Um, you'll notice it has the same sections of observe, reflect, question, and then investigate. And so, and there's a qu sample question there uh, that a student could ask. So we've, we've made this interactive for students in a couple of different ways, trying to make it as flexible for your use as we possibly, possibly could. The next place I'd like to uh, take you from the classroom materials is a quick look at the presentations and activities. Um, I'm not going to go into every click of every page because that would be a much longer webinar than we have time for. But I do want to point out that we do have presentations and activities. For example, the American Memory Timeline, access to primary sources through a timeline of American history. I'm going back to the teachers page now. Again, this is my anchor point for you. Um, <clears throat> and I'm just going down this left navigation. And I'd like to take a peek at professional development now for a moment. You are participating today in professional development, but we have other options. So taking a tour of this page. Take online modules. We have six self-directed online modules addressing the kinds of questions that we hear most often. Um, what does the Library of Congress have for me? What does an inquiry approach look like with primary sources? And that's an interesting module because it has actual footage of uh, fourth graders analyzing primary sources in deep and uh, really meaningful ways. Copyright, and then two samples of analyzing primary sources using two of the more popular visual formats, photographs and prints, and also maps. And then we have a module on finding primary sources. Um, 
now is the moment I'm going to tell you that if you're really interested in learning how to search the library's website more effectively and efficiently, just this afternoon we um, scheduled a webinar December 10th, 4 p.m. Eastern Time. That's the current plan. As I say, we just settled on this this afternoon, but watch the Twitter feed at Teaching LC or the Teaching with the Library of Congress blog for details on this, if that's a topic of interest to you to go um, more personally and more deeper than these online modules do. Back to the professional development homepage, if you're trying to figure out where I am. Um, we also had, have um, PDFs available of the kinds of workshops we deliver when we work with teachers, and that's all there for a click and um, take it away and go. It has everything you would need to develop, uh, excuse me, to de deliver a workshop. The next thing is webinars. We are in the middle of one right now, um, but we host these at intervals. And one of the things to know is that we also record them. So if you go to this page, you can see that so far this uh, year we did a Constitution Day primary sources webinar, and that recording is available. And there's a link to this event, the online conference, and all of these recordings will be up beginning next week, um, available for you to watch and share with friends. Back to the professional development page. Every summer we host summer teacher institutes. Those are week-long programs that teachers apply and get accepted to come to. We have uh, do not charge for these, so this is a great opportunity. Um, there are your fees for travel and lodging, but with a little advance notice, a lot of teachers have been able to get grants through local organizations for that. So if you want to do a really deep dive and come, uh, quote, live with us, unquote, for a week, that's a terrific opportunity. And we'll be putting up that application I would say within the next month or so. Um, Mike, if you have details on that, add that to the chat. I say that because, uh, not to put Mike on the spot, but because he's one of the main organizers of that event. Back to the teacher's homepage. I'd like to anchor you again and point out we have a number of local partners. Thanks, Mike. So look for that application coming up in December and again watching the Twitter feed and the libraries, uh, the Teaching with the Library blog are the best places to have the early information about that. We have part a whole consortium of partners, the Teaching with Primary Sources partners, um, throughout the United States, providing professional development more locally. And as part of that program, there's also a journal published, published online. And that's a rich place if you want to explore some theory and get also some practical, um, some practical applications of that theory, you might explore the TPS journal. It always has a current issue, and right now that is teaching with the fine and performing arts. But there's also an archive, um, and we'll look at that in just a moment. So here's what's in a typical TPS journal issue. There's a feature article, in this case, primary sources from the fine and performing arts. There's a section on research and current thinking, if you want to explore that more. There's a teacher spotlight an interview with a teacher who's been working with this theme. Um, and then there will be learning activities at both the elementary level and the secondary level. Because again, when we talk to teachers, we learned, we heard that teachers are very adept. You are very adept at adapting things up or down a little bit. Um, so you don't need us to write a first grade lesson plan but you can see an elementary level one and take it to the level appropriate for your students. 
Here's the archive. So you can see there are a lot of topics covered. Um, literacy integration, elementary learners. I saw a couple of questions flash by on elementary, and Mike will be giving me those questions a little later when we pause for question and answer time. Historical thinking. So lots of topics here if you want to learn the theory and also see some more, addition, some more um, activities. I would be remiss if I didn't point out one of the perhaps best kept secrets of the Library of Congress. And this might be the answer for a number of you who have had some fairly specific content questions that I may or may not be able to answer in the context of this presentation. But the library offers an Ask a Librarian service. And you can see the little pink box at the top of the page. That'll take you to this page. And you can see uh, this is staffed by a wide array of experts from all over the library. So um, think about if you have a, uh, a teaching specific question, probably direct it to resources for teachers. My colleague Dana, um, who's also staffing our Twitter feed this afternoon, uh, will field those. And uh, she is dedicated to getting you an answer. There she is in the chat. Hi, Dana. Dan is dedicated to getting you an answer within five business days and often much, much sooner than that. But if you have a content specific question about, say, newspapers and periodicals, for example, or you're a language teacher, you can see we have a number of international collections. The library collects in uh, more than 100 languages. I should know that number, but I don't off the top of my head. I want to say 140. Colleagues, if you uh, have the number up, at the top of your head, feel free to correct me. Um, so use this service. 500 languages? Good golly. Um, <clears throat> anyway, I, I distract myself reading the numbers. Um, use this Ask a Librarian service if you're not finding something that you believe we probably have. Here's a list of the high-level resources, um, library's homepage, loc.gov. And again, these are all hot links, as are all of the pages in this from during the session and also during the uh, recording. You can go directly to any of those. The page for teachers, where I've spent most of my time this evening, is loc.gov slash teachers. And we do maintain a blog, blogs.loc.gov slash teachers. And that's a terrific place to explore some of these very particular questions um, as well for teaching elementary students. We have a science teacher in residence who's been blogging. So we have more science than um, in years past. So if you haven't visited us lately and that's of interest, check us out. Um, as I say, this is a terrific place to uh, explore some ideas. And one of the things that I really enjoy about the blog is it's a place to hear from teachers. And so we, we appreciate your feedback. Um, Mike, I'm going to leave this slide up and ask you, to what questions have you fielded for me? Well, a few questions. Let's start with, and this is these are content questions, so may, uh, so you can answer. Or Dana, also, if you're still on the chat, you can chime in too. But Maria asked, do you have materials I could use in my Spanish class, and specifically for elementary? Maria, um, if you're looking for class for materials that are in Spanish. We most of what we have is probably going to be a high reading level because because you layer in the fact that it's historical. Um, but I'm making a guess on that because I've never taught elementary Spanish. I will say that what we hear from teachers is that the visual materials cross language. And so if you're having your students analyze a photograph, for example, or read a map, they can do that in any language and practice their language skills describing. The other resource that I would point you to, although it is outside the scope of
what I said I was going to do is I've just put in the link for the World Digital Library. Um, we had a whole session on the World Digital Library earlier this evening, and you might check that out. They have materials in many world languages, and um, the information about those materials can be translated into uh, seven different languages, all the languages of the UN plus Portuguese. And Dana chimes in, thank you, Dana. I, I knew that once, that um, Chronicling America, or historical newspaper database, also has some Spanish language newspapers. And um, Dana has pasted in the link to the advanced search tab where you can specify materials by language. So there, there are a lot of things. Um, the other thing I would point out is, and Dana, maybe you can find the link for this while I'm chatting. We do have a primary source set that we've built out of the World Digital Library, and um, that might have some ideas for you also. I'm going to pause. Maria, if you want to clarify your question, I see you're typing. That's terrific. Um, Mike, thank you, Dana. That was very efficient. Um, Mike, if you have another question while Maria's typing hers, I'll go ahead. Awesome. I'm glad that you find visuals helpful. I see a number of people typing, so I'm going to pause. And Mike, what's the next? Sorry, I believe I was muted. Emily asks, what materials would you suggest for an English teacher doing a unit on the American dream? Emily, that's a huge question. And um, I think there are probably a lot of things, depending on exactly how your students or you are defining the American dream. Uh, there is, as Dan has pointed out, a lesson plan on the American Dream, and that would certainly be a starting point. Um, I would suggest adding to that a good search in Chronicling America to see what experiences um, people had. Um, just give me a, a yes or a why if you can hear me. Janelle, I see, is asking about sound. Yes? OK, perfect. Thank you. Just wanted to make sure. Um, as I was saying, I would explore uh, Chronicling America as well, because I know for certain sure that Chronicling America went live online after the American Dream uh, lesson plan was published. But those are some terrific starting places. Mike, um, what's the next question? Just to, and also just to reinforce what uh, what Cheryl said earlier, while she's doing a really good job and Dana's doing a really good job sort of answering these um, off the cuff, that Ask a Librarian feature is really something to utilize for these questions as well, as they're going to take the time to, uh, to give you very thoughtful answers as well. So the next question is from Christopher. Uh, and he's asking about the use of the resources are permitted, are uses... It really has to do with copyright. Can they use these as a teacher? Um, if you're, I'm not sure if from the site, yes, almost all of them. Please, all of the materials from the teacher's page, all of the teacher-specific materials are entirely for your use. Use them as you need to. Share them widely. Um, we do like it if you give us credit. Um, but yes, use them. That's why we create them. And since they're created by uh, government workers for hire as part of our job, they're not covered by copyright. So take those. Um, most of the primary sources are also outside the bounds of copyright. Um, and when we build teacher materials, we're pretty particular 
to check whenever possible that they're that they're not covered by copyright so that you don't have to worry about that. Um, I'll also point out, though I am nothing like a copyright expert, and that's my disclaimer, that for the most part, if you're using them in the course of your normal teaching, you're probably covered by fair use. Um, you'd want to do a much closer investigation if you're doing anything uh, published or putting it on a t-shirt or something commercial that you might sell. But yes, Christopher, I, I hope I've answered your question. And if, if you have more details or something I haven't gotten to, um, please feel free to add those into the chat. Great questions. Thank you. Michael, what's next? Here's another question that's come in. This one is one that often comes up. Does the library have a copy of every manuscript ever produced? So I've heard of a manuscript. Can I automatically get it at the library? Oh, boy, it'd be great if we did, but we don't. So that's, a, that's kind of a quick and easy one. No, I don't think anybody in the world has a copy of every manuscript ever produced. Um, I'm just going to jump line, Mike. I see that Christina has asked, are there any new library materials or programs for teachers on the horizon that you can get a sneak peek of? You know, yesterday our uh, Director of Education Outreach did a whole program on just what's new and what's coming up. So if you weren't able to attend that, Christina, look for that recording next week. and. Um, we're always up to something, and that's all I'm going to say about that. But watch the recording. Um, Shall we have time for one more question? I think it's great on time, so bring it. Sure, I have another question. I believe you might be muted. Um, the question is, what's the best, uh, you know, it's kind of from a new teacher's perspective, what's the best way for me to get started with primary sources? You may have to unmute. Sure, I'm just muting when you're talking, otherwise uh, people get feedback. Um, but thanks for reminding me of that. You know, as a new teacher, I think the best way for you to get started with primary sources is probably to explore those primary source sets and Mike or Dana, if one of you would want to plug that uh, link into the chat box, that might be helpful. But skim the list of primary source sets, find a theme that you're teaching, and then pull up one or a few related primary sources. Um, think about your teaching purposes. Look at the teacher's guide, see what ideas there are, and then dive right on in. You know, give it a try. Ask the, you know, give the students some space to work with it. One of the things that we hear from teachers is pretty consistently how surprised they are that their students are able to think way above what they would necessarily expect. Um, so, you know, dive right in. If you have somebody in your district or building who's experienced with primary sources, you might ask that person for tips too. Um, and especially if it's somebody who, if you can find somebody who's teaching your same subject, that person might have in mind some ideas um, on how you could get started that might already tie to your curriculum. And I see some of you thanking me. That's wonderful. You're very welcome. I'm glad that you were able to join us. I will point out before you leave, we would be grateful if you would give us a little bit, bit of feedback via the three questions about this session on the SurveyMonkey, and the link is right there on the slide. Mike, I'm going to mute myself. I believe you have at least one more question for me, and we have a few minutes. So if there are more questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. Yeah, um, I'll, my typing will catch up, but essentially the question is, what are, uh, from your experience working with teachers, what are some of the creative ways that teachers are using these primary sources with their students? I love that question. Um, there are so many creative ideas we have heard from teachers. Um, the thing that has struck me most recently is just how, how across the curriculum primary sources can, can be a good fit. 
for teaching content ranging from anatomy um, to astronomy to uh, languages other than English to English itself. And, and I, as you may or may not have noticed in the bio, English language arts is my background. And I'm just constantly delighted at the possibilities with that. Um, one of the things that uh, I personally have been engaged with is bringing in those historic American newspaper pages to add some depth and context to um, the primary sources, especially if you lay the foundation with visuals and then ask your invite your students to continue their research um, with additional primary sources. And the newspapers are wonderful for that. Um, they're also wonderful for propelling additional kinds of questions because, of course, when you're looking at a newspaper page, you're not reading about just the one thing you started with. Uh, and that's maybe a little bit of a danger of using the newspapers is it's easy to get sidetracked. But I call that building historical context. And Bonnie is pointing out, thank you, I, that she loves using photographs as a way to engage students. And absolutely, um, it's visual, it levels the playing field, students can access uh, the photograph uh, according to their own experience. They can observe uh, using that skill that you used earlier in the program. Thank you for playing along. Um, and you can then deepen it. One of the things that I particularly, again, English language arts teacher, love about photographs is talking with students about how a photograph has a point of view, um, perhaps more subtle than a written piece, but there's absolutely a photograph. And thank you for all of the ideas you're sharing with each other. Thank you for the questions. Mike, I'm going to mute myself and uh, back to you. I, don't, I haven't been tracking the questions, so I don't know if you have anything more for me. Um, Dana's been busy putting in blog posts from teachers uh, documenting their uses. Mike, uh, any other questions, or is it time to wrap it up? Um, I don't have any more questions. We do have another minute. Uh, if, if somebody else has a final question, please enter it in the chat window. Or if uh, you or Dana have anything final, uh, final um, for the good of the cause, uh, now would be a great time. Okay, with that said, oops, oh, well, well, Christopher comes in with a, with a question. Here you go. Um, Christopher asks, may school groups come to the Library of Congress? That's a great question. And the answer is absolutely. Many, many school groups come every year. Um, Christopher, if you um, are planning something, I would say, and want something formal, our visitor service offices do great tours for students. Um, they fill up fast. So if you know you're planning to come, you should absolutely, um, I'm sorry, I'm getting distracted by the chat. This is why I've averted my eyes. So I'm going to avert my eyes from the chat again for a moment. You should absolutely contact the visitor services as soon as you know. Oh, Iris, that is my favorite question of the night. I'm, I'm hoping you're sitting down. Iris, the fee for these online resources is nothing. We are your tax money at work. There are, at work, there are no added fees. Um, please use them. Please share them. Please use Ask a Librarian to find more that you can use. Dana uh, has posted the link, the direct link, if you want to explore a visit to the Library of Congress, Christopher, or anybody else. Um, <clears throat> it's a beautiful space, wonderful exhibitions. Well, thank you, Cheryl. I, I agree. It's been a great session. And thank you so much for leading us through that. And also for everybody in, in the chat for your great ideas. And thank you, Dan, as well for um, all your work in the chat as well. I want to um, uh, reinforce what Cheryl said. We'd love to have your feedback following this session. So please 
uh, click the survey link there and, and provide any feedback you have for us. It's greatly appreciated and it helps us improve the program. Other little items that you might want to know going away, in five business days you will be sent instructions um, to access the certificate. The certificate will um, show that you've completed one instructional hour for this webinar and depending upon your school district you may be able to get continuing ed units for that. Uh, I believe we've also mentioned this session has been recorded. So um, next week, check out loc.gov backslash teachers. If you want to watch the recording again, and even perhaps more importantly, please share that link with your colleagues so you can introduce them to these resources as well. Well, we thank you again for uh, attending this session uh, of L Library of Congress 101 for teachers. Uh, good luck with your use going forward, and please do not hesitate to contact us with any questions. Thank you. Good night. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.